I mean, this was his view of uh, democracy, that a member of parliament was a delegate, not a representative. He didn't owe uh, the people their judgment. He was to be given orders as to what to do. And that lay behind the left's campaign. That was the ominous and, in my view, absolutely outrageous aspect of their campaign. This is what really lay behind um, reselection. It wasn't to have the reasonable accountability for a member of parliament may getting too old or out of touch and who ought to be called to account by his constituency. No, no, they wanted to be called to account by the 30 or 40 hardline lefties who dominated the constituency Labour Party. That's what he wanted. In Brussels, Roy Jenkins, the former Labour Chancellor and Home Secretary, was nearing the end of his term as President of the European Commission. From his headquarters in Europe, he watched the developments in the British Labour Party with horror. The Labour Party then, after the um, defeat in 79, um, did take a great lurch to, to the left. The party was taken miles away from the sort of social democratic internationalist um, pro-NATO um, view, which was the Labour Party I'd been brought up in from the days of Attlee through, through the days of Gateskill. Jenkins' dismay was shared by other senior Labour politicians on the right of the party. Former cabinet ministers David Owen, Bill Rogers and Shirley Williams became known as the Gang of Three. In the summer of 1980, they wrote a letter to the Guardian protesting at Labour's support for immediate British withdrawal from the European community. I remember we just felt angry and betrayed in a way. Um, and so we could never accept this reversal based simply on the National Executive Committee's decision to change sides 100% on the European issue. And that, of course, was one of the big factors which later led to the split uh, in the Labour Party. We raised the question about, dismissed a centre party, but raised the question about whether or not if Labour couldn't represent a sort of uh, democratic socialist view, then a social democratic voice would have to emerge. So we raised it. But again, it was not in any intention to do anything other than fight. And we were certainly going to fight through to the October party conference. The warring factions gathered for a showdown. The right was pitched against the left, the leader against the grassroots. The party was divided as never before. For Tony Byrne, it was the climax of the campaign for party democracy. He was determined that the Labour government would never again ignore the policies voted for by the party conference. The feeling in the hall was that we were to blame, that we were the guilty men and women, that we had betrayed the party, the movement, the principles. And this was, I suppose one can laugh about it now, but wasn't funny at the time, this was emphasised by the actual layout of the hall. Um, the Member of Parliament was sitting in a sort of hen coop, which looked exactly like the guilty men at the Nuremberg trial. Uh, there we were, row after row of us, looking like defendants at some awful accusation. Jim and the Parliamentary Party were virtually scapegoated for the loss of the election, which meant that delegate after delegate could point a shaking finger at them and say, there are the traitors to our cause. And it was a very, very nasty conference. Many of us in this conference are also angry about much of what the last Labour government did and a great deal of what the last Labour government failed to do. And we have the right, comrades, to be angry and to do something about our anger. The great cry of treachery was a speech made by Tony Blair in which he listed all the promises that the Labour Party in government had broken. Reflation of public sector service spending, ruled out. Substantial cut in arms expenditure, ruled out. The immediate introduction of a wealth tax, ruled out. The imposition of selective import controls, ruled out. I think he listed 12 promises. Eight of them we hadn't made and four of them we'd kept. I regarded the cry of treachery as not so much a mistake as a lie, a convenient lie for people who wanted to take over the Labour Party. The problem was, in part, of course, 
that the parliamentary leadership regarded the conference as just a launching pad, rather like uh, firing a rocket from Cape Canaveral, and the parliamentary party was in the capsule, but the first stage of the rocket fell harmlessly into the Caribbean, and then the capsule went where it wanted. Right-wing MPs were outraged at the left's proposals to give more power to trade unions and party members, a recipe, in their view, for a Trotskyite takeover. Andrew Folds, MP Andrew for Wally Folds. East. Quiet. And I represent the true Labour Party in Smedic. Not the Workers' Revolutionary Party, nor the militant Trots. <laughs> who have who have, who have infiltrated so many constituency parties, as you know. <laughs> Madam Chairman, the baying of the beast betrays its presence. You can hear them. But the left were convinced that the old order was being overturned. Labour would return to its socialist roots. You really felt that some power was in danger of changing hands, and I'm sure that's why we aroused the opposition uh, that we did. It was fundamentally about democracy. No doubt we were a bit over the top at times, but it was about making leaders accountable to members. Uh, and that seems still to me, even with the benefit of hindsight, even though I've now become an MP myself, that still seems to me an honourable cause. The left were demanding mandatory re-selection, the right of ordinary members to sack MPs. Joe Ashton, Parliamentary Labour Party. Madam Chairman, there's no doubt that whatever happens this week, there is underneath a very great demand in this party for unity. But ask yourselves, if we have this question of mandatory reselection, what sort of unity there's going to be in many constituencies? Ask yourself, who outside the Labour Party wants mandatory reselection? I opposed it strongly right from the beginning, because I knew that if that happened, a lot of MPs would defect. The right-wingers who knew two or three years in advance were going to, they were going to be booted out would form a party of their own. So I went to the conference and said that. If Roy Jenkins wanted to form a party of 25 sacked MPs now, in this parliament, they could be in business in six months. Here comes the clincher. Here comes the clincher. I must Wait. ask conference to show now, some good manners and some tolerance. This, I asked on Monday that we would listen to arguments and it's absolutely disgraceful if people don't do that. Good enough the platform. I guess they'd be 25, they turned out to be 27. It was a source of some resentment at the conference that the Gang of Three was now actively considering splitting from the Labour Party. Nobody who hadn't spent their life in the Labour Party, I'm literally from toddler days on, could imagine what it was like to leave it. It was really like breaking out of a long-lasting marriage uh, where you'd gone through all kinds of ups and downs, joys and agonies, and you couldn't imagine life without it. So those who were the critics, in a sense, imposed much too rational a view upon us. We were emotionally profoundly attached to the Labour Party. It was the whole, or not the whole, but a very large part of our lives. And the idea of breaking away was something that, if you like, we put off beyond the point that it made any sense. Quiet, please. I now have the result of the last card vote. In the past, the Labour leadership had always been able to rely on the block vote of the trade unions to keep the left of the party in check. For the resolution, 3,609,000 against 3,511,000. But the trade unions, still smarting from the winter of discontent, supported Tony Benn's proposals for constitutional reform. The left carried the day. We had defeated the block vote. I mean, it was always portrayed as, in, in the media as though it was a small band of extremist conspirators uh, um, who were undermining democracy, but just about the exact opposite was the truth. We were the majority. We always knew we were the majority. So we defeated them in 1980. Uh, and uh, the atmosphere was electric because, of course, we were up against the entire machine. Everything that could be thrown against us had been thrown against us. I declare the motion carried. It was appalling. Uh, there was poison uh, in the air. Um, there was a real sense of triumphalism by those who, by this stage, the Benites, who'd taken over 
the uh, campaign for Labour Party uh, democracy, that they were the masters now. And uh, I remember talking to one of those uh, leading lights who just said to myself and a, a colleague, uh, listen, uh, we're now running the party. It was a very uh, offensive uh, approach.